The second scripture reading this morning continues where we left off with the first chapter of Paul's letter to the churches of Rome, picking up with the eighth verse. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. May God's blessing continue to rest upon and flow through the experiences of Scripture on this day. May it continue to guide the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips. Universal salvation is a bold claim to make. There was a book that was written more than a handful of years ago now by a pair of Quaker ministers. Gully and Mulholland, If Grace is True. They did a follow-up book, If God is Love or Since God is Love. And in the argument of the first book, If Grace is True, they say God will save everyone. It's a very persuasive argument. It is an emotionally based argument. It is one that is based in their personal experiences as clergy. It is a book that got them in a lot of trouble. One was eventually defrocked. Because it's not considered theologically sound. This idea of universal salvation. Paul makes an argument for universal salvation. In his opening of this letter to the book, uh, the letter to the churches of Rome, he is talking about God's ability and desire to bring everyone into God's presence. That's Paul's understanding of salvation, to bring everyone into God's presence. And Paul talks about the strength of the gospel in doing this. And what we have to understand before we get too far is Paul's gospel as he understands it. The gospel is very simple for Paul. Christ crucified and risen. That is the good news. So whenever Paul talks about the gospel in any of Paul's writings that we get into, we have to remember when Paul says gospel, Christ crucified and risen. Because in Christ being crucified, the sins of the world are forgiven universally. No ifs, ands, buts. And in the resurrection where we place our hope, there is salvation. We are drawn to God. That's how Paul preaches the gospel. It's the earliest gospel we have in record before the gospels are even written, before Mark sets pen to paper and says, this is the gospel. Paul is out proclaiming Christ crucified and risen. And so he pens this letter or dictates the letter, depending how we want to look at it, to the churches of Rome. Churches he's never met, people he's never been to. I use the term church, that's actually a misnomer. These are house churches, these are bodies of faith, they wouldn't call themselves church necessarily at this point. And the first thing he does in connection to his call as a preacher of the gospel is give thanks. Your reputation precedes you. The work that you are doing, the way you are responding to God's call 
that is known throughout the world already. The gospel (coughs) rippling out. So Paul begins his arguments and his letters with giving thanks. And an assurance that everyone should know that Paul is praying for them. When Paul is talking about this nature of God, this gospel, this good news, he begins with giving thanks and prayer. And he says, I hope we can get together one day. I hope we can actually meet face to face one day. Letters in the ancient world were a way of being actually present to each other. When one is absent, you would send them a letter. It's even the case a little bit now. It's, it's a little bit easier to do, to send a note, a picture, to be present in someone's life. In the ancient world, the letter was literally being present. So Paul sends the letter. And even though he says, I'd like to be there, having the letter is him being present. Having the written word is him being present. Now, you know, think about that. Having the written word is Paul being present. And when he writes about the gospel, it is present. And he said that this gospel that we have been given, this gospel that has been given to first the, the, the people of faith, the people of Israel, and now to people beyond the household of Jacob and Abraham, those who are, had been in some circles considered left out. This gospel that is written and physically present is shared because it's owed to the world. It's not something that we hang on to. The letter is not something we hang on to. It's something that goes from church to church, from community to community, from household to household. That's how Paul's writings would go around, and that's what he intended to do. Galatia, when we read the Galatians letter, it's not a single city. It's a whole area. Like Paul's letter to Virginia Beach. It doesn't stay in this house. It goes out. And the letter is being present. And the gospel is in the letter. And the gospel is a living entity. Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And that gospel, and this living entity that has power to it, it's God's power. And that power is a power that desires that relationship that salvific relationship, that embracing of everybody. It's not a power that seeks power for itself. God's power doesn't do that. God doesn't need to seek power for God's self because God is God. We struggle with that because we tend to sort of want some sort of power and authority for ourselves. We have to exercise our autonomy because we are not God, no matter what we might believe. And so Paul, in this letter to the Romans, when he says, I I would like to be there, he's there already. And he says, I'd like to be there to be part of the gospel. The gospel is there already. I would like to be there because being present together is going to embolden our faith in this gospel. It's going to allow us to embrace the power of God more fully And we're going to find as we are embraced by God's power more fully, God's power embraces more and more people. Now, I'm sure that the folks that were in the house communities in Rome, in their immediate household, were looked around and said, yeah, okay, you know, we we can all be embraced. I like that. But the household across the street, Mm, not so much. I don't like the idea of them being embraced, right? We're humans. We're not God. And yet, Paul's letter, the physical presence, the power of the word, proclaiming Christ crucified, risen, this desire for relationship, it is one that is going to continue to grab more and more and more. And Paul wants to make sure to drive that point home because even in Paul's lifetime and in Paul's description of Paul in the book of Acts, 
he doesn't believe that everyone can be embraced. He wrestles with that idea. Can everyone be embraced? Now, Gully and Mulholland make their argument for universal salvation, and I recommend the book if you're interested in it, even if you come out sort of hating it and sort of saying, I can't believe this, you know, read it and think about it. But understand what Paul is preaching with his take on universal salvation is that everyone can be potentially embraced. There is no one that is beyond the grasp of God. The gospel, Christ crucified and risen, the power that is there in it, the presence that is there in it, even if we are not physically with each other, if we are there in writing, if we were there in thought and there in our hearts, it is as if God is indeed there in thoughts and in heart, and it is embracing in our faith. Our faith orients us then toward God. So Paul says, I, I want to be so close to you. I want to be in this place together. I want to get to Rome. The irony is Paul does get to Rome. And maybe it's some of those folks that took care of him when he was in prison. And maybe in that time together, his faith was emboldened as he was moving toward his eventual execution. And maybe their faith was emboldened as well. And, and, people were saved. People were saved. So our faith, our growing faith, that is there because we are present to each other, our growing faith because the text is present to us in this day, our faith because God hopes enough to gather us in, brings us to this place where God surrounds us. We are saved. Saved to do the work that people like Paul and others were set aside to do, to preach the gospel, to send out that power, to be present, to be church today. Thanks be to God. And amen.